Our unison scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 4, verses 12 through 23. Please join me as we read together. Now when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness among the people. I'd like to ask the children to come forward at this time. Good morning. We have Violet and Scarlet and Matthew and Declan. Am I right? Got it right. Pastor Robin isn't here this morning. She's recovering from COVID. Have you, any of you had COVID? No, good, good. I don't think you want it. Uh, and we need to continue to pray for her because being sick is no fun. Am I right? Okay. Um, does anybody know who I am? Okay. That lady over there, she's my sweetheart. I'm Mr. Walsh. For the last couple of weeks of Sunday school, last few weeks of Sunday school, going back into December, uh, you've been learning about the birth of who? Matthew. That's right. That's right. Uh, and how old do you think Jesus was when you last met for Sunday school? How old was he? Matthew? Um, oh, 1,031, how old he was? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure how you come about that number. Um, he was a little baby when, when he was, when we last met. Not, not a little baby, maybe a toddler. We think that he was about two years old when, or the oldest he was, was about two years old when the wise men came to visit. Remember the wise men? They came, they saw, what did they see? And they came and found Jesus, uh, and they gave their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Do you remember what they saw in the sky that led them to Bethlehem? Matthew. A sheep? Well, there were sheep there, yeah. There were shepherds in the field, keeping watch over their flock, Violet. They saw a star, that's right, and they came and they followed the star, and they came to Bethlehem, and they gave Jesus their gifts of gold and frankincense and what? Myrrh, right? Okay, um, there's another story in the Bible about Jesus when he was about 12 years old, and, uh, and, and that's, in, that's in the book of Luke. But uh, that's the last we hear of Jesus until he is all grown up. And uh, uh, when, we, uh, when Jesus was growing up, he was living in a town called Nazareth with his mother Mary and his brothers and sisters. But then he decided to move to a city called Capernaum, which is by a big lake called, that they call the Sea of Galilee. And it's, and it's still there today. 
Now, a few minutes ago, Mrs. Fievelin was up on a platform and she read, she read a, uh, a story, she read part of a story from what book of the Bible? Cleveland read, a, read a, a, a story from the book of Matthew, which is your name, right? And, the, and the, the story says that when Jesus moved to Capernaum, it was like a light came on in their town. Uh, now, Jesus didn't glow in the dark, did he? <laughs> and, and he didn't counter, carry on a big, a big lantern or, or a flashlight, did he? Do you think? Okay. But Jesus... So that's not what the Bible means when it says that the light came on when Jesus moved to Capernaum. But he taught the people the things that they needed to hear in plain, simple language, kind of like your teachers uh, do in school. They teach you the things that you need to hear in plain, simple language. He taught them that Jesus taught uh, his followers that God loves them and cares for them. He taught them that they needed to treat each other kindly and to be honest and to take care of the people who were hungry and homeless and sick. Some people thought that, uh, some people back in those days thought that uh, we get sick because we've done something to displease God and God is punishing us. Uh, and, you know, people might think Pastor Robin is sick and maybe at some point she did something that, that displeased God and God punished her by get, letting, letting her get COVID. But Jesus would say, that's nonsense. People don't get sick because God is punishing them. That's not the kind of God that uh, uh, she worshipped, that we worship. That's a, that's a dark, confused thing to say. But Jesus so, show, uh, uh, shined a light on that, so to speak, and he, he, he helped people think clearly about things like that. And to show that he what he was saying was true, he healed people. He healed some people who were very sick and who were, who were injured. Now, let's go back to the light for a minute. The Bible that we have here, which has a book with Matthew's name on it, the Bible that we have is also a source of light, just like Jesus is. When you study the Bible in church and in Sunday school with Mrs. Walsh, and even at home, you are learning what Jesus taught the people 2,000 years ago, that God loves you, that God cares for you, and that he wants you to take care of one another. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you, we thank you especially that, that Pastor Robin is getting better. We pray that you would help her to get completely well so that she can be back here with us next week. We pray that you would bless us as we, as we study your word this morning with Mrs. Walsh, and we pray that you would help us to see the things that we needed to see from, from what we learned in Sunday school and what we learned from your word, to be kind to one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another. And, uh, and uh, we, we ask these things, and we ask your blessing on our time in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Now. So uh, I was very happy to hear, um, hear uh, a word brought to the children this morning. And it was a story, a story about Jesus. And, and uh, stories are extraordinarily important. And it's really important, I believe, to tell these stories to our children. I was, as a way of introduction here to both the scripture and sermon today, um, um, yes, I was appalled when I asked my granddaughter at, uh, at the the. the the Christmas dinner table, um, you know, well, surely uh, you, re you remember Jonah, and she looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> and then I looked at my, my daughter and, and my son-in-law and gave them a glare. <laughs> I thought, no, we got to tell these stories, right? So here's, this, here's part of the story, and, and we'll go on with it. And here it is from the third chapter in the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I'm about to tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh. 
according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city by a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going that day's walk and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal or herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry out mightily to God. All shall turn there from their evil ways and from their violence that is in and upon their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. And God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed God's own very mind about the calamity that he was that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. And this is the word of God for the people of God. If you've read the, uh, if you've read in the, uh, the uh, your bulletins about uh, the title of the sermon, Minority Report, Minority Report, it's not going to be about the Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report, which is a pretty good movie. And reading some things in the newspaper this morning about technologies and the dangers that it presents to our, our, our nation and our world, it might have made a pretty good sermon, but it's not mine. Okay. Um, but when I wanted to talk about Minority Report, what I was thinking about was not necessarily the movie, but Minority Report as the respectful way to offer disagreement to the majority of people. And I think the word respectful is exceedingly important there. Because you see, the faithful folk who lived in post-exilic uh, Jerusalem, which was about 500 years before Jesus was born, give or take a few days, about 500 years before Jesus was born, um, the Jews had had come back, they had been, had been banished, they had been in exile in Babylon and uh, for, for over 40 years, and now they had been released from, from, their, from their imprisonment and their oppression by the king, uh, the, king the emperor uh, Cyrus, who was the Persian emperor at the time, and they were sent back to Jerusalem, and they all, uh, uh, they all or many of them, uh, kind of assembled in uh, a ragtag groups and, and headed back to Jerusalem. And they decided what they were going to do once they got there, having seen that the very walls of Jerusalem had been torn down and the very city had been burnt up nearly to a crisp, they decided that they were going to rebuild the walls and rebuild the city. And these, these, various, uh, these various stories can be heard in the books of, of Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible, two of your favorites, I'm positive. And uh, the, um, also here, 
uh, Jeremiah, pieces of Jeremiah, also tell some of what was going on for those people who had lived in oppression for well over 40 years and now came back and once they had decided that they were going to rebuild the walls, they knew what they were going to do. And uh, here's, here it is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of Babylon, um, he has devoured me. He crushed me. He's made me an empty vessel. He swallowed me like a monster. He's filled his belly with my delicacies. And he spewed me out. May my torn flesh be avenged on Babylon. The inhabitants of Zion shall say, May the blood be avenged on the inhabitants of Babylon in Jerusalem to this very day. So Jer Jeremiah is saying, you know, I know what we ought to do now. We ought to take revenge upon those people. Well, not just that. Nehemiah had said that as they were reading their Bibles, as they were reading from the very word of God in the, the public square, they found a place where it was written that no Ammonite, you know about them, don't you, the Ammonites, and the, and the Moabites, yuck, should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with bread and water, but they hired, had, that, had the nerve to hire that dastardly soothsayer Balaam against them and then proceeded to curse them. Yet our God turned that curse into a blessing. So here's what we need to do, folks. Because 500 years, the people of the Moabites didn't serve our people on their way to war. We need to have, because the women, have you noticed that lots of times in the Bible, it's the women? The women had married aliens. And half of their children spoke another language. And they couldn't even speak our language. And I contend with them and curse them and beat some of them and will actually pull out their hair. This is in the Bible. And I will make them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for, for your sons or even for yourselves. We need to cleanse ourselves from everything that's foreign. All those immigrants, out. All those aliens, out. No intermarriages. We cannot have any kind of thing. And this was the majority report for the people of Israel about 500 years before Jesus is born. Actually, more like four. Well, then we have Jonah and Jonah's story, which is a kind of, I would suggest to you, minority report. The minority report, along with oh, other books, like the book of Ruth, which is a little different. But I could not resist this, because the, you weren't going to hear about the minority report as a, as a movie. But I'll bet you, you will recognize this, the most famous theme song, from any movie, any time.
right? You only need about four notes for that. <laughs> Jaws. I was a surfer on Long Island and, and even saw sharks in the water many times. But when, after I saw Jaws, I was terrified of going back in the ocean. Oh my gosh. But it's Jonah. Da -da. The word of Jonah, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, who was evidently the son of Amathai, which must be important, I guess. It's in the Bible. Um, and it says, you know, go, go right now. Go at once to the Nineveh, the great city. And I think it's really interesting that God calls Nineveh a great city. God recognizes Nineveh, even if the people of Israel don't recognize the greatness of the city. Cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And uh, Jonah, who had much better ideas evidently than God, <clears throat> got up and ran the exact opposite way towards Tarshish. Then, and we know this one, a mighty storm came, comes upon the sea, a, the ship is threatened to break up, and the sailors are really terrified, and they cry out to God and to each other. They throw all the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it up for themselves, and Jonah, meanwhile, does this remind you of anything? Had gone down below and fell asleep. The captain came and woke him up. I wonder if the captain's name was Peter. I don't know. And, you know, what, what are you doing here, sound asleep? Get up! Call on your God. Perhaps your God will spare us so that we do not perish. Then there's, I love it, in, in the Bible, and, and as, a, as a Methodist, this is a particularly an aberrant part of the Bible, they have a dice game. <laughs> They're going to gamble on who's going to get to do what. But they, at any rate, they have this dice game, and they, they pick Jonah, and, uh, and Jonah is evidently the winner, ah, and they throw him overboard. <laughs> I don't know if I want to win that one. So, and they throw him into the sea, and immediately the sea ceased to rage. But, but, God provided a, depending on how you read it, a big fish, a whale, or more precisely, a sea monster to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that sea monster for three days and three nights. And then the narrative portion of Jonah stops. And then Jonah springs out into a kind of, must have been a libera, uh, uh, a, uh, 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 into song, because it's all poetry from then on. And he's, uh, he's going, oh, I call to the God. No. <laughs> I called upon God to my distress, and God answered me out of the belly of Sheol, and I cried, and you heard my voice. And he goes on, and he prays for about the next two chapters. I'll spare you. He, he ends it with, as my life is ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came upon me into your holy temple, O God. And then we get back to the narrative, and in what must only delight the kids, the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out onto dry land. As a kid, I used to love that. It was great. I can, I can still see, I still got this, this in, my, in my head today. You know, but there's a couple of things, you know, Jonah... Jonah has a better idea of how to handle the creation of the world than God. Now, 
I'm not saying that anybody here ever really has a better idea than God, but I do often. And I find myself telling God what to do pretty much every day. <laughs> Dear God, here's how I want you to handle the political situation in our country. <laughs> Dear God, here's how I want, Dear God, this is what I think ought to happen next. Dear God. I don't really mean dear God, but I say it because that's how I was taught how to pray. I rarely pray. You know, not my will, but yours be done. I'm the person that you will find on his way to Tarshish very often, going in the exact opposite direction that God has instructed because I have a much better idea of the way things should be than God. I know that it's not right to be angry. I know that it's not right to continue to hold grudges, to hold on to my resentments. I know that it's not right for me to take inventory of all the ways other people are way less than perfect. I know it. God has a message for me. You know, you're so concerned about other people, or in the book of Jonah, about a bush. As you remember, you know, now, Jonah had gone to Nineveh. We heard in chapter 3, he speaks to the, to, the, to the Babylonians, and he says, you know, you got to change. And they change, which he's kind of ambivalent about. He's like, eh, I wish they didn't, because I kind of wanted to see them all get uh, the wrath of God. But God was merciful. And here, Joan is looking out the way God has mercy upon these Babylonians, upon these Democrats, upon these Republicans, upon these people across the aisle. And he doesn't like it. He goes out. He sits down in the hot sun. God, just to prove God's point, sends an east wind, which is a very dry wind, upon him, but also sends shade from a tree. He's sitting on the plain, finds the one tree, it grows up, it provides shade, and Jonah's going to sit under it. Jonah, again, not really satisfied that God exact, knows exactly what God's doing, curses the tree. So God sends a worm into the root of the tree, and the tree dies. Now, Jonah is sitting in the hot sun, and he forgot his suntail lotion. He wants to perish. He wants to die. And God says, what is it, Jonah? What is it about you? What is it about you, Jonah, that you're so concerned about a tree in the wilderness? What is it, Jonah, that you're so concerned about the shade upon your head? What is it, Jonah, that you're so concerned about yourself? that you have forgotten the people of Nineveh. They have wives and husbands. They have fathers and mothers, and they have daughters and sons. They have lovers, and they care for each other. They're people like you're a person. They're people. You care more for the tree that's giving you shade or not than you do for the people. My people, says God, the people whom I have created, 
these people, these people that you are banishing from your midst in the minority report because they're aliens in this land, the people in your midst who you will not have anything to do with because they don't speak your language, these people, says God, who don't look like you, don't have the same color, don't worship even the same God. You take less stock of this than you do of this tree that provides you shade? Oh my. Oh my. Should I not, says God, be concerned about Nineveh, this great city? in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not yet know that their right hand and their left hand are from the Lord. Nineveh is saved in this story. There's a way to read the book of Jonah. If we insist on reading Jonah as if it were a, an historical account and go out and look for fish that can swallow men or women, if we go out and we try to find places that and times that Nineveh was actually faithful to God, we're going to be sorely disappointed. But this is a story about God and about who God is and how God is in the world. It's about how God can take our brokenness and our sinfulness, how God can take our hatreds and utterly transform them in our very midst over the course of a night and provide shade for us and provide shade for them and provide goodness and mercy and even salvation that God is in the business not so much of finding fault, but in loving and providing compassion and mercy. This is the story of Jonah. I think it's a story that our children need to hear. I think our children today are surrounded in this world filled with utter hatreds for each other. So much so that the people who run our nation, when they sit down in the halls of Congress, have forgotten who they are and whose they are. It's not okay. We need to find ways, Pat, to be kind. And it's really, really good for your mental health to find the places in your life where you have done a kindness or someone else has done a kindness to tell those stories to your children. Because we're the people of the gospel, which means good news. <laughs> the gospel. Because you see, when Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. How long did it take before they followed him? Remember this morning? Immediately. And not just one, not just two, but, but many of them. Right away. They didn't think they had to go to Tarshish first. <laughs> they didn't think anything. As a matter of fact, they knew where they needed to go. 
And in another, another story in the gospel, in the good news, we find that there was another windstorm that suddenly arose upon the sea. It was so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. And Jesus, too, was down below and asleep. And they came and they woke him up and they said, Lord, save us, for we are perishing. And he said, O ye of little faith. And immediately the storm stopped. And they were saved. We need a little bit of faith today. We need to tell the stories of kindness. We need to recount all the ways that we are thankful and extend that into our lives and share that with others and find all the aliens and all the people who don't necessarily speak our language and that would mean the people on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> and instead of talking, maybe we ought to listen. And then we will surely know that God is saving us all. <laughs>